to start the new season when you can start fresh with some new series. You know, we, we were uh, the summer in Psalms, and I, I really, really appreciated all of those Psalms that you wrote and turned in, and uh, we're looking at uh, putting together maybe a, a, our own book of Psalms, the, the, the Songs of the Harbor, and, uh, and publish those. And um, But it was really meaningful to hear your experiences, your faith, your uh, issues shared like that, uh, so vulnerably. And uh, so anyway, I want you to, I want to thank you for that. Um, have you ever noticed that uh, you can learn a lot listening in on people's conversations? <laughs> uh, sometimes more than you want to know. Uh, I, I, leaned, I just came up on the train Friday from California, and, and the train starts in LA and it, and it goes up to Seattle every day, you know. And so she got on at 3 in the morning in Reading and 4.30 in the morning because they were late. But, um, and then got in about 10, just as the soccer game at the stadium was letting out. So we ended up driving to Bellevue <laughs> because we couldn't get on the freeway to get home. And so that, that made her trip a little longer. But, uh, but, but she was telling me some of the conversations she heard on the train. And one of them was this, uh, this couple, and the guy was just stoned out of his mind. And, uh, <laughs> Which always makes for interesting conversation. And he was going on and on about how he wonders when this train is going to go out west. And the conductor is saying, well, you can hardly get any more west than this. And he's wondering where the cowboys and the Indians are and all this stuff. You know, and he's going on and on. And his wife is going, shut up. Just be quiet now. But... He didn't take that subtle hint. Uh, so anyway, you know, so we learned, you know, that, that when you're actually on the edge of the water, that is west. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't get that. But, um, and, and, and then she said there were some people down the way. She didn't tell me exactly what they said, but she said that the, the whole 18 hours was filled with um, F-bombs going off and, and salacious stories. I don't know, that, you know, to the pure, all things are pure, so I don't know, but, but I assume that for 18 hours of listening in on that stuff, uh, wears, wears thin after a while. Uh, I think she was hoping that they would meet up with that other guy and get stoned and change subjects, but <laughs> that didn't happen. Um, so anyway, but uh, have you noticed that the conversations are good? And sometimes you can you can walk up to some people that are talking and they're in the middle of a conversation and you think you understand what it is and you jump right in and they look at you like, what planet are you from? You know, and, and because what you thought you heard was not what you heard. So what we're going to do in the next uh, forever is um, we're going to look at the conversations people have with Jesus. Different people, different conversations, different issues, different topics, and see what we can learn about our own lives and our own faith and our own uh, situations and how God deals with us through eavesdropping on these different conversations uh, throughout the Gospels. And uh, we were talking at a staff meeting this week, and, and uh, Jana said, you know, you could probably do... 10 weeks just on the conversations Peter had with Jesus. You know, you forget everyone else in the Bible, but his were always up and down and wild. So um, we'll see. Um, today, I want us to start by looking at Luke uh, chapter 5. It's a familiar passage to some of you, and, and this does deal with Peter, by the way. This is a conversation with uh, Jesus and Peter that we're going to uh, eavesdrop on. And, um, Luke 5. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake at Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put a little bit out from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, We've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything, but because you say so, we'll go do it. I'll let down the nets. I think that's more sarcasm than irony. But because you say so, 
And when they'd done this, uh, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they'd taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you'll catch people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore and left everything and followed them. So Lord, teach us. Teach us how we might hear your voice and how we might respond to you and how we might follow you. That's our, that's our need today, in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a really important passage and a really important um, conversation that we get a chance to uh, observe. Uh, one of the misunderstandings that I have had in, as a young person growing up uh, in the church and looking at the Bible is it seemed to me, I had this mental picture, it was a wrong one, but it was a mental picture that Jesus walked up to strangers, said something to them like, follow me, and they dropped everything and went and followed him. Their life was changed. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's really great, you know, for them, thanks for a quick moving Bible story. But in my own life, it seemed like there were more layers. It was more complicated. Uh, Jesus has probably said, follow me and don't be afraid more than once, you know. And I didn't just follow Jesus and everything was perfect. Uh, and so, what's really happening? Now, if you were to look at... Uh, and Matthew and Mark's version of this, it takes about two verses. Jesus walks up to these guys in their boats and says, follow me, and they jump out of their boats and leave the dad with, with the work to do and follow Jesus. That's it. And you go, okay, that's what, you know, that's what God wants to do in our life. But this, Dr. Luke, uh, which I appreciate. He, he always gets into details of things. And, and so he takes a much longer look at this, of what really happened. And so you see that um, Jesus is doing what he does. He's standing out by the lake and the crowd's coming. Pretty soon the crowd's getting so big that uh, he's kind of pushed to the water's edge and, and the crowd keeps pushing and uh, I guess he hasn't figured out walking on water yet. So uh, he sees a couple of boats and then he gets an idea, you know, I'm gonna go get, I'll go get in, in Simon Peter's boat. <laughs> and uh, probably talked to him, said, you know, how about you row the boat around and stabilize it while I teach here, you know? And I could bet Simon Peter's going, that's what I was planning today, <laughs> you know? So one way to get somebody to listen to a sermon, you know, get, make them work. <laughs> to make it happen, that's a good thing. And so, um, so uh, Peter's doing that in the boat, stabilizing things and keeping the boat going, and Jesus is teaching. And when he's done speaking, he says, uh, Jesus says, instead of saying, okay, go back to work, or let's go home and get lunch, it's, hey, I got an idea, let's go fishing. And that, that's like me saying to Rory McIlroy after the U.S. Open, you know, why don't we go play some golf? <laughs> You know, uh, because because Peter knew fishing. I mean, this was his life. He owned the business. The others were his partners, his family business. It, it was a big thing for them. They had two boats and nets and supported a lot of people. And, and so he was comfortable in this area and he knew it and Jesus didn't. And I think that's why he got a little sarcastic. Okay, you know. Just because you're saying it, I'll do it, okay. But I've been out here all night. We haven't caught anything. It's not working. And uh, But I'll go ahead and do it. Now, does it strike you as odd that Jesus would just pick somebody in their boat and climb in it? You know? You don't do that down in the marinas. I think I'll just get in this boat and do stuff, you know. Um, that's actually not all that popular. And, and I couldn't understand why would Jesus, with crowds around, all these things, and just in a, in a minute, just say, I'm going to go get in Peter's boat and do my teaching from there. 
And, but if you look at Luke 4, we find out that Jesus left the synagogue, in verse 38, went to the home of Simon, went to his house. And Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and he asked Jesus to help her. He bent over her and, uh, and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she got up at once and began to serve people. And the sun was setting, and people brought to Jesus all those various kind of illnesses, laying on of hands on each one, and he healed them. Demons came out of people, shouting, you're the Son of God, but he wouldn't let them talk. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place, and people were looking for him, and he said, you know, I'm done. And uh, I added that at the end. And uh, Andrew said, wait a minute. There was a... There were already encounters. There was a relationship forming before Jesus got in the boat, before the, the conversion experience. In fact, you know, Simon probably had one of the bigger homes in town. And uh, he was there with his family and his wife and, and the in-laws. And, um, and so Jesus was there and it was, he's watching it go on in his own home. And people are coming in and healing is a big thing and crowds are coming to the house. And, and you see that Peter had a history of watching Jesus from the sidelines. He wasn't just out in his boat and Jesus walked up. They'd had an experience. Jesus had been in his home. He'd helped his family. Uh, probably helped Peter get in better with his wife since the mother-in-law was taken care of and uh, her mom. And, and so Jesus was kind of part of the family already when he said, Hey, I'll go get Peter's book. And uh, now it's interesting that one of the one of the best things you can do if if you want to uh, uh, be a witness for Christ and introduce people to Jesus, one of the best things you can do, and we're going to see this throughout the Gospels, is to ask them for help. If you ask uh, your pagan friends for help, they are willing to do it. You ask your Christian friends for help? Not so much. <laughs> you know, you're busy. We're about the Lord's business. I can't help you. But, but if you ask your pagan friends, you know, they're gracious. Sure. You know, use my truck. Help, I'll help you out. We can do stuff, you know. And, uh, and that's Jesus' style. It's, it's not what can I do for you. It's would you help me with this? I'm kind of stuck here. Could, could you help me with this? And pretty soon they're involved in ministry before they even have a relationship with him. You know, this used to happen. We used to have uh, um, short-term mission trips go out from the church I was in. And inevitably, people would come and say, yeah, okay, we've got this trip and we're going down to Mexico or something. And we're going to do these things. And I've got a couple of friends from work. And they said they'd heard about it and they'd like to come with us. And But, you know, they're not Christians and, and they're... They're really not Christians, and, and so it probably it's not okay for them to come. You know, maybe once they have faith and everything, then they can come and be part of the teams. And I'd always say, no, 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 bring them. You know, it's either going to send them to heaven or hell, being with us for a couple of weeks. You know, <laughs> uh, one, one way or the other. But but they're going to be able to serve and care and see God work and and hear conversations and participate. What a great way to introduce people to Jesus. Right? Don't wait until they're in the kingdom to let them serve. Let them serve now, and then down the road, maybe they'll meet Jesus. You know, that, that's okay. And, and it, was okay, it was okay with Jesus when you're dealing with Simon. And so but you have the situation where Jesus says, okay, let's go fishing. And, and Simon begrudgingly says, okay. And they go out. And, they, and, and then you can just hear Simon complaining. And I've done this all night long. And I know what I'm doing. And I can't do anything. And what good is this? And you don't fish during the daytime anyway. This is, you know, and this is not when they're biting. And uh, he's going through all of this. And then pretty soon the nets fill up. And it's a big mess. And now they have too much success. Now, it, it's interesting to me that, that listening in on this conversation... One of the ways that Simon tries to keep Jesus at arm's length, avoid the relationship, is by his strengths. The things he knows. He's competent when it comes to fishing. 
He knows that. He has the business. He has a success rate. This is some, this is his area. You know, Jesus, you can stick with the Bible study stuff, but I'm good at this. And, and the very confidence that comes with being good at something is used to keep Jesus away. I know what I'm doing. This is my area of expertise, Lord. Don't mess with this. You go ahead and help all those sick people and stuff and do that teaching thing. That's great. But don't mess with my world where, where I'm confident. And when Jesus goes in and then this overwhelming catch of fish comes, uh, Peter's perception of his world and his confidence suddenly is changed. Because um, Jesus said, no, I'm going to be Lord of your world too. I'm going to be Lord, Lord of, of your expertise. Now, I love that when this happens, almost immediately, what's, what's Simon Peter's response? Look, look down in um, verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me. Get out of here. Why? I'm a sinful man. So now look what happened here. First, he tried to hold Jesus at arm's length through his strengths and his confidence and what he really knew, right? And then when Jesus overpowers that and demonstrates that he's Lord of all, then what do you do? You try and hold Jesus away by your weakness. I couldn't keep Jesus out of my life because of my competency and strength, so I'm going to keep him out because I'm a sinful man. Lord, you got to get away from me. Leave me alone because look at me. I'm not, I'm nothing, you know, obviously troubled. Now, how many times do we do that where we, where, where we, we try and keep God out of certain areas of our life? <laughs> One, because we're really strong in it, or two, because we're really weak and vulnerable in it and susceptible. We use both of those. And Jesus is so absolutely unimpressed with that. Un incredibly unimpressed. He doesn't care about our strengths and weaknesses. He can use those. He doesn't care about our uh, shame and secrets and our sinfulness. He can use that for his glory. But in this conversation, Peter does both right there. He's done everything now to keep Jesus away. And Jesus' response to him is an interesting one. Instead of talking about Simon Peter's sin, you, oh, you're a sinful man. Well, let's go into that a little bit. Let's talk about what do you mean by that? What is uh, the nature of sin in this global economy? Uh, what is the, he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't even say, you want to confess some stuff here while we're out in the boat with your business partners sitting here with us <laughs> and their dad. <laughs> it's a good time to hear confession. You know. Besides to smell like fish. Uh, he doesn't do that. What does he say? Look, what does he say? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And I could just picture Simon Peter going, who said anything about being afraid? I never said anything about being afraid. I said, get away, because I'm a sinful man. You don't have to be afraid. And Jesus knows, like we're learning, that probably the number one thing that keeps us from embracing a relationship with Jesus is our fear. Throughout the Bible, our fear. And so he says, don't be afraid. And he says, from now on, you're, you're going to use all your giftedness, all your knowledge, all your fishing inside. It's like, obviously, I'm not a fisherman, so I don't know what, what all that entails stuff, you know, <laughs> and uh, we're going to use all of your giftedness and we're going to use all of your weakness and all of your failure and all of your shame. We're going to use all of that 
for a kingdom purpose now, and you're going to fish for people. You're going to harvest people for the kingdom of God. And I think that when, when Jesus encounters us, we use all our defenses, you know, whatever we can find to keep him at arm's length. He's in our home, he's in our work, he's wherever we are. And uh, he said, I want to transform you. I want to transform your giftedness. I want to transform your secrets. I want to transform all of that for the kingdom of God. And we're going to use it all. Now, years ago, uh, which I didn't ask permission to say this, but when Sheila and I used to work together in California, uh, at a nice church down there, and she came up with a theme for our church that was, uh, you, know, you probably don't remember this, a place for you. And she even wrote a theme song that was on the radio every week on a radio program. Uh, it was really cool. And uh, it was called A Place for You. And we talked about it. We got so excited. What a great theme this is for our, for our church. Um, it, originally, it had been uh, a growing church for a changing world, <laughs> which didn't make any sense because they, they wanted to grow, but they didn't want to change. <laughs> the world changed, but we're not changing, you know. And so, so Sheila came up with this brilliant idea that the theme of our church is going to be a place for you. And people from all over the community or the radio broadcast, wherever, would, would hear about Christ and know that, that, you know, you can come home. There's a place for you belong here. You're not an outcast. And, and, you know, it was really fabulous thing, I thought. But I misunderstood something. See, because when we thought about it and when we started using it, it was all about reaching out and, and uh, reaching people with the gospel and bringing them in and letting people find a, a place in the, in the church. But what happened was some of the longtime members got a different message from the theme. And they got the message, uh, and I get letters about this. You say this is a place for us, but there's lots of things I want to see happen here, and it's not happening the way I want it. So I guess this isn't a place for me. And I get these letters, you know, and I go, wow, didn't see that coming. <laughs> I thought this was about reaching out. And, and so, um, but it was a, a strange thing where people went, you know, it's a place for me. This is the way I want, I want to be comfortable here. I want everything to work the way I want it to work. And that was the way they interpreted that motto of the church. And, and I, I'd have to say to them, okay, look, this is not a place for you to get your way. This is not a place for you to be comfortable and settle back. But this could be a place for you to get a whole new purpose for your life. This could be a place for you to discover that, that uh, you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ that transforms you and the people around you. This could be a place for you to realize that you can serve beyond what you think you can do and make a difference in this world. This could even be a place for you where you could love some people that nobody else likes. And when I say that to people, they weren't happy. But I think that's still true. What is it that God calls us to? He calls us to, to a place where he has his way in us. In our hearts and in our minds and in our lives and in our work and in our home and in our relationships. And he said, let me take all of that that you are and, and transform it for the kingdom of God. Will you let me do that? And if we say yes, we say yes, Lord, come on in. Come into my life, come into my heart, my mind. Have your way with me. And Lord, I'm gonna surrender control, maybe every day, maybe a couple times a day. I'll surrender control to you. And you can transform me and others in this. I think that's what this conversation's about. It's not Jesus going up to a bunch of strangers and saying, follow me, and they leave their family business and follow him. That's not the way it worked. It was, Jesus was in his home, 
he was watching things happen. He saw the mother-in-law get healed. He watched. He had to listen to the sermon because he was stabilizing the boat. You know, couldn't get out of it. He was a bystander. And then he saw Jesus go right into his own work life. Not be shocked by his pushing Jesus away with his sinfulness. And instead, said, okay, I'll follow you. I'll follow you. Have your way, Lord, in me. I hope that my life gets to be like this down the road as we go. I hope I see Jesus from you know, observing, see how he works in others. I see how he works in some of you as you share your stories. And I think, well, maybe he can do that in me. And I get some hope in that, right? And then uh, we get surprised along the way as Jesus doesn't back away from us no matter what our resistance is. So, what do we do? I want, here's, here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to start, just like you, know, you listen to someone else's conversations on the train, crazy as they are, um, I want you to start looking for conversations with Jesus that are going on around you. I want you, if you're sitting in Starbucks and you hear some people talking about things, picture Jesus at the table with them. And what is he, how is he engaging with them? How is he responding to them and their issues? And then I want, I want you to move from a bystander to invite Jesus into your life, really. Not just a religious thing, but say, Lord, I want to have a relationship with you. I don't want to just be a bystander. I want a relationship. I want to know that you love me and you care for me and you're Lord of my life. And so I surrender the control. Now, it doesn't matter if you've been following Jesus for 50 years. You can still say that prayer. You know, I've been converted 100 times or more. Um, probably a lot more. But, um, and I need to still say that from time to time. right? And so... Um, Let's make that our, our prayer this week, and we'll discover that this actually becomes a place for you. Right? Come alive in a home way. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you don't leave us, you don't forsake us, you don't abandon us, but you always come towards us. And give us the courage to take down our resistance, our excuses, whether there are strengths in our knowledge or our sin or whatever it is, give us the courage to take down our resistance to you. And Lord, come into our lives. Make us new by your Spirit and lead us day by day as we follow you. That's our prayer today. In Jesus' name.